And then fluid bronchograms we pointed out in some of the other um, shots, but they're one of those things that really makes the lung look hepatized. They make it look a lot like liver. Here's liver, here's lung. They look a hell of a lot the same. And partly that's because of these tubular like appearances when you get fluid that occupies the airways instead of air. How predictive is this for uh, bacterial pneumonia versus atelectasis? I don't think there's any primary literature on that. Okay, and then pitfalls. Uh, there's two parts of the body where you need to know as you're scanning, I may run into mimics of pneumonia, uh, right next to the sternum where the thymus is gonna live in younger kids. And on the left side, uh, lower next to the diaphragm where the stomach is going to live. So mm -hmm. here's a real pneumonia sitting on um, the, there's a real pneumonia in this one sitting on the diaphragm and just compare that to how you might get faked out at the beginning of your scanning by a solid appearing uh, structure within the chest that has a bunch of punctate white areas within it. Again, here is a true pneumonia with branching air bronchograms and here's a thymus with punctate material within it. So a lot of that decision-making is based on like where you are. I'm where I'm going to find thymus. And then other parts of it are based on things like transition to air. Do I see a wet edge? Do I see a deep transition to air? And the best way I can come up with describing what the thymus looks like, people say starry sky often. I say jiggly brains. It looks like jiggly brains. Um, here's an example of a pneumonia. Again, sitting right up on the heart, so you can't always use location. It's got, to me, fluid bronchograms and air bronchograms within it. So ways of making the distinction are some of those features like fluid bronchograms and branching air bronchograms versus the starry sky or jiggly brain's appearance of the thymus. Uh, pneumonia is going to have that dirty transition to air, whereas thymus is going to have clean borders everywhere. And location and age are another thing you use in trying to make the distinction. And keep in mind that you can have both. So this is a great uh, clip that Greg Harvey, one of our POCUS faculty, captured um, of someone who has a pneumonia that sits right up against their thymus. So here's that homogenous appearing kind of uh, starry sky thymus. And then here's the pneumonia with fluid bronchograms and a dirty transition to air that pops up down here as the clip plays, telling you which is which. And when you're on the left side of the patient, that's when you can encounter the stomach. So here I've got what looks like sharp lung signal, but then, oh, look at this lesion and the air is displaced downwards. Here's my transition to air. I guess this is a consolidation. Only here's my diaphragm in the zone of apposition. So keep in mind, you, you see something in that area that you think is a pneumonia, always look for that possible transition to air. And there are things that you'll see in lung scanning that are not just this binary, is it consolidation or uh, like, is it pneumonia, is it not? So what do people see going on here? Could be a thymus, could be a pneumonia. Yeah, could be a thymus, could be pneumonia. So I guess my uh, binary series of questions would be lesion or no lesion? A lot of head nods for lesion. Branching ear bronchograms? Yes, no. Okay. Uh, that's totally fair. I look at this and I say, there's a bunch of hyperechoic signal within this thing, but I don't see branching ear bronchograms. I don't see these lines that give off more lines like a tree. So my description of this might be, there is a lesion um, with a bunch of punctate hyperechoic uh, content. So this ends up being a kid with uh, malignancy and metastases. 
And this is a, a great clip from uh, Cherise Kwan, um, who is currently on maternity leave. She's our director. I'm our current interim director. And this is just one of those things that I've been hoping to find in chest scanning for a long time. So certainly there's air here in the chest. We've got that A-line kind of appearance. But there's this weird thing going on with how this air moves, right? So I won't uh, pimp people too much on this. Uh, this was a case of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So you're seeing air moving in the chest, but that's bowel loops. And it's basically like abdomen up in the chest. And as we uh, kind of move over to pleural effusion now, um, we get what's often referred to as the lung tongue sign in cases of pleural effusions when you're scanning with the linear probe. So you'll be scanning down, you'll get to that area in the uh, costophrenic angle, and you'll see that compacted, almost solidified area of lung float up and down. It wants to be down there in its home in the costophrenic angle, but it's displaced by that fluid. So if you're going to do a really thorough job of scanning pleural effusion, let's say you've scanned the linear probe and you found it, I would suggest that's a time. I don't, in all of my scanning on chest, switch to a low-frequency probe, but I do when I find a pleural effusion. That's when I'll pick out one of these guys, and I'll do an approach that's like a fast. So fluid in the chest is going to be a very thin line if your patient is lying flat. If they're sitting directly straight up, it might split itself between the costophrenic angle anteriorly, posteriorly to the side, I want to make the biggest pocket of it possible. So I like to have the patient in a 45 degree angle to kind of pull it all to the back costophrenic angle where I think I'm going to get the biggest pocket of fluid. And then I'm going to scan like I would for a fast exam for a hemithorax view. I'm going to capture the solid organ, the kidney, the spine, and then I'm going to start heading a little bit more superiorly towards the head to get views like this. Patient is in 45 degrees. What's that? No. I, I like to say 45 degree angle. So I've got the spine. That's one of the things to look for in these views running from the patient's feet down here up towards their head. And what should happen is that air that runs all over the top of this diaphragm should eliminate my ability to see the spine going up into the thorax. Why can I see the spine in this patient's thorax? Because I've got fluid that allows the beam through. And so this is an example of like a simple appearing pleural effusion. I don't see uh, a bunch of echoes from it. I don't see uh, a bunch of spider web within it, as opposed to a kid like this, where the chest is like filled with this fibrinated, loculated spider web. Uh, this kid's gonna need vats or a whole lot of fibrinolytics to, uh, to clear up this kind of complex pleural effusion. All right, so we covered a lot of ground in that and I'll uh, turn everything over to both the people in the room and on uh, the Google Hangouts for questions.